When you are looking in scripture and you get to passages and you get to a word and you think, what about that word means? Fully. You know, or I wonder if that's it's something about how you read it, you think, that's a little that's a little odd phrase. So you click on the word, well, and you're looking on a computer. I click on the word to see what the Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic word is. And one of the <coughs> things about that is you will sometimes click on, like, say, fish, and it says the word means fish. <laughs> and you're like, okay, well, that didn't really net anything, so to speak. But then there are other times where you click on it and the word has a meaning that just expands the meaning of what you just read. And you think, wow, that says a lot more than just what the translated word meant. One of those words is the one that you, whoa, 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 stop going. Stop going. Stop going. <laughs> Um, one of those words is erite. Erite is a Greek word. And I was reading a passage and I clicked on the word and it said that the word that had been translated was erite. And this is a word that has a lot of plain translations that fail to do the original word justice. It's pre presented in scripture as goodness. Virtue, excellence, wonderful excellence, moral excellence, or integrity. You may find, when we turn to the passage, you may find all of those words in the place of erite. A lot of different words, all with subtly different meanings, <coughs> none of which does erite full justice. Excellence as a word we're all familiar with. But as a personal practice, I think most are unfamiliar <clears throat> with it, thinking that it is outside of their grasp. We use this belief to justify our lack of effort. You see, excellence is not an intrinsic ability-based issue. Excellence is an effort-based issue. It is an exercise of the will. Every last person here is capable of repeated excellence in all their various tasks. It's possible. But you have to desire it. The question for you today is, do you desire excellence in all things? The lazy may ask, why should I desire excellence when mediocrity requires far less effort? We see this in our workplace. Or maybe you say, I would be willing to desire excellence for the important things, but for everyday tasks, why should I? Stay tuned today and let us see how your creator feels about this issue. Erite, this word found in various places in the New Testament, has far more meaning than the simple translation demonstrates. Here you see the definition for erite. And we see it comes from the word below, 730, male. That's kind of curious. That caught my eye first. I was like, what? From and it says male as stronger for lifting. Okay, that's where erite comes from, that, that root. But erite <laughs> means from the same as 730 properly, manliness, valor, i.e. excellence, whether intrinsic or attributed, praise and virtue. <clears throat> ah, does that strike you as, as interesting? It, it struck me. I remember when I looked at that, I was like, huh? Manly? Manly excellence? Like, what does that mean? Uh, that, it just, it, it struck me as odd. This isn't a garden variety job well done. This is performance or moral behavior so remarkable 
that manly valor would be associated with it, or it's like a heavy lifting excellence. That's curious. The term valor means strength of mind in regard to danger. That quality which enables a woman or man to encounter danger with firmness, personal bravery, courage, prowess, intrepidity. Now, when have you ever used that word before? Intrepidity. They did that with great intrepidity, and it was accomplished on time. Thank you. Phoenix does another good job. Intrepidity. It's not a word you frequently see used. And I think the reason we never see that being used is we see it demonstrated so infrequently. You could rephrase Arete as the following. Strength of mind enabling steadfast excellence even in the face of threat or conflict. So what moral situations are we talking about that involve danger? Well, moral behavior when no one else is looking. Moral behavior when no one else is looking. Can you say the internet? How about uh, when large sums of money are at risk? How about when you have to leave your personal comfort zone to be the hands and feet of God? Oh, I can't do that because I'm this kind of person or I'm that kind of person. And, you know, that person over there, they're good at it. I can't be the hands and feet of God. But what did Jesus say about this? Matthew 25, 35. For I was hungry and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger. You took me in naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison. Ooh. And you came unto me. Takes a little bravery to reach out to these individuals. It's outside of your comfort zone. Ooh, homeless, naked. Ooh, hungry. Ooh, ooh. That's our Jesus talking there. These are expectations. Valor, bravery, intrepidity. These are expectations. This is acting when your flesh desires to do nothing and leave it to someone else. Do we have an issue here? I, I think we do. Ladies and gentlemen, I think right here in this assembly, we have an issue here. But we're not the only ones. The church across this nation and across this world clearly has an issue here. Just look at our recent news. You see, when it comes to demonstrating steadfast fast moral behavior, we have an issue. Just look at our shepherds. You see, our shepherds are falling left, right, and center. And when the shepherds are falling, the sheep will likely be subject to the same illness. These are not uh, you know, rare. They're not random. And you want to know something really sad? Of that list, of that group of individuals, these are all pastors. Four of them came in the last two months. And I did not have to leave Texas. This is just Texas in the last two months. And you say, well, but not us. This last, the last article you see in front, that's a full year. It's back in 2022. There are 10 different names in this list. 10 pastors of huge groups. Is there an issue here? And I will remind you, I was very careful about which ones I chose. I, there's so many of them that I can... Be picky. None of these are Catholic. None of these are Lutheran. 
Methodist, Presbyterian, you know. No, no, no. These are evangelicals. They're Baptists. They're, these are Bible churches. Supposedly individuals who know better. The shepherds are falling like flies. And is it an issue for the sheep? I saw an inter it's, it's kind of interesting how the Lord feeds you these things on, in a good time and fashion. I saw an interview with uh, George Barna last night. Barna, the guy who does the research about uh, religious attitudes. Do you know that between before COVID to now, 57%, I think, of Americans said that they uh, attended a church at least once per month. But today, it's 35%. That's a big drop. These are people who have some affiliation. If you ask individuals who, who uh, identify themselves as evangelicals, are we born with original sin? Only a third of them say yes. Two thirds of evangelicals don't know whether we're born with sin. Seriously? What do we have going on here? Our sheep don't know the word. And why is that? Because our shepherds have left the ranch and they're wandering around preying on individuals. We have an issue. We have an issue corporately and we have an issue right here. So don't, this isn't like other people, okay? It's an issue we all need to come to term with it. All right, let's get into the word and see what we can do. This is 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter one. And we're gonna start at verse one. 2 Peter chapter one, verse one. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of the Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, or glory and excellence, or glory, depends on what your translation says. That is erite, okay. We are called to glory. What is glory? Do you feel glorious? Anybody here feeling glorious? We're called to glory. Great honor, praise, or distinction, a highly praiseworthy asset. That's what you're called to. And then you're called to erite. And we've already gone through the definition of it. Manly, valorous excellence. We're called to glory and manly, valorous excellence. Does it say periodic glory and virtue? Does it say situational glory and virtue? Convenient glory and virtue? No. No. It says glory and erite, continuous glory and virtue. In my home, as a child, there was a quote that hung on the wall, and it was from one of my dad's classmates when he was at college. They were the same year. It was this individual, you might recognize him, Martin Luther King. It said the following, if a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets even as Michelangelo painted, as Beethoven composed music and Shakespeare wrote poetry. He would sweep streets, he should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. I remember I can, I, I wondered as a kid, I looked at that and I thought, why would the angels even care? Why would they care? With age, I began to appreciate the point that was being made 
with doing everything to bring glory to God, your creator. Developing and using your unique giftedness to the glory of God. Everyone sitting here today has a unique set of gifts that he planned before the beginning of time for his work here on this planet. And the only way that that gets utilized is if you develop it and you use it. It's the only way that he gets the glory. I'm going to brag on a kid now. They're going to hate that I'm doing this, but it, it is what it is. It makes the point. So one time when in grade school, Micah came to school. He was a crossing guard. He came to school, and uh, as crossing guards, when you're a little kid, you put on this reflective vest. You go out and you direct traffic and everything. And uh, he, he, he only do it once or twice a week. He came, and whoever was supposed to be there wasn't there. So he quietly went in, put the vest on, came out, did the crossing guard duties, and went to class. Didn't say anything to anyone. The teachers knew who was supposed to be there. They didn't say anything to him. They did talk to the principal. And the principal came over and said, you know, I just want to commend one of our students who saw a need and met a need. Nobody told him to do it. Nobody required him to do it. There was nothing to gain. Didn't expect it to even be noticed. Arete. That's an example of Arete. And what did it do? They know where he comes from. They know what he believes. Why? Because we Christians look different than everyone else. They know who we are. Every place you go, every workplace you go in, they know you're the Christian. And they are watching like a hawk. And when you do things that you don't have to do with excellence, it brings glory to God. Excellence is a choice. Excellence is a habit. There's a missionary to northern China who was an Olympic gold medalist, Eric Lindell. He said the following, God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. Eric Lindell, uh, when he was doing his missions work in China, uh, didn't always have it smooth. His life was not all garlands and gold medals. In 1943, during World War II, the invading Japanese army captured the area of China that he was in, and he and a bunch of other missionaries were placed in the Waishin internment camp, along with all the China Inland Mission uh, missionaries. One survivor of that was the American theologian Langdon Gilkey. He said the following, often in the evening I would see him bent over a chessboard or a model boat or directing some sort of square dance, absorbed, weary, and interested, pouring all of himself into the effort to capture the imagination of these pinned up youths. He was overflowing with good humor and love for life and with enthusiasm and charm. It is rare indeed that a person has the good fortune to meet a saint, but he came as close to it as anyone I have ever known. You see, Liddell felt God's pleasure when he was running, but despite the lack of food, horrible conditions, constant threat of death, he set himself about the Father's work with Arete, and he felt his, gl his glory there. He felt his pleasure there. Excellence is a choice. Excellence is a habit. You see, the process of physically disciplining yourself and spiritually disciplining yourself is the same. It is the same valorous application of the mind to accomplish the task and is only successful with the divine power. Do you repeatedly fall, fail to discipline yourself to the level of spiritual excellence? 
Do you feel that frustration? Paul did. How do you have that happen? Well, I can truthfully answer that I felt that frustration. Let's look a little deeper into Arete, and we'll start with what Arete is not. It's not mediocre. It's not expedient. It's not good enough. It doesn't ever involve the least amount of effort to get the job done. It's not focused on completion over excellence. It's never convenient. It's never easy. Erte is not that. Think of a moment of someone you have known who does or did everything with excellence. Okay. I bet most of you have somebody in mind. Why does this come so quickly to mind? Well, because <laughs> individuals who live like that are unique. They stand out. Do you find it annoying? Are they annoying to you? Why is it annoying to you? Because their witness testifies against you. It troubles your conscience. That's what we are all called to do, to be praiseworthy and have valiant excellence. Oh, I'll display moral excellence, but I'm too tired to do that in the rest of my life. Nope, it doesn't work that way. We are creatures of habit. Disciplined people are disciplined people. Excellence is a choice. Excellence is a habit. Let's dig back into where we were reading to figure out why. Okay. In our sec second Peter verses, how does grace and peace get multiplied unto you? Through the knowledge of the Father and His Son, mediated by the power given to His faithful ones. The same knowledge beckons us to glorious, valorous, moral excellence. The key is what is your goal? As we look at this target, what is your goal? What would be acceptable to you? Is it the blue or better? <coughs> Maybe it's the red or better. Anywhere on the target, just hitting the target would be good enough with me. Is that, would that be good enough for you? You see, what you're aiming at makes a difference. Not even the 10-point area is acceptable to me. You want to know where I'm going? <coughs> I'm going to that. Let's see if I can get this. I'm going right here. Is that cross? I'm aiming right for the cross. But literally, and figuratively, I'm aiming right for the cross because my Lord and Savior did it perfectly. That should be our goal. Some of you are thinking, well, brother, we can't get perfection. It's not possible. You know, when you're aiming for perfection, in practice, you may not get perfection. In fact, you're likely to not get perfection. But what's important is what you do after you've shot. <coughs> if you do an action or an activity or a behavior or an effort and you find on assessment, I didn't hit the cross. If you objectively assess what has been done and you calculate how you're going to alter that behavior, that effort, that whatever, so that we can get onto the cross, then in the spirit will enact the change. If you never hold yourself accountable or your fellow brethren never do so, then you will never get to your goal. I heard an F-18 pilot, I, was, I saw interviewed, he was one of the uh, Blue Angels, and they said, 
what were some of the important lessons you learned as a Blue Angel? And he said, own your errors. Own your errors. Because if you own your errors, you can then take measures to correct them. And what you'll get to is excellence. The devil is in the details. Minutia makes a difference. You know, um, there is likely someone out there right now that is saying, I can't be perfect, it's impossible. And then I want to point you to a certain Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gave. Matthew 5, 48. He was talking about loving those that don't love you. Something we're going to get into a little bit later. But at verse 48, he says the following. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Man, that sounds like a command to me. Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Doesn't sound like mediocrity is accepted at any point anywhere. That's pretty cut and dry as far as I can see. There's a difference between perfection and excellence though. Perfect means being entirely without flaw or defect. Excellence is very good of its kind, eminently good, superior. Let me see if I can give you an example. The archers at the Olympics aim for perfection. They're lined up 70 meters from their target, and they, um, these individuals are experts. And these experts are, has been provided by the excellence of their training. They had went through an incredibly hard qualifying process. They spent endless hours of practice, weight training, cardio training, enforced sleep schedules, sports psychologist sessions, and careful diets. But you know what? <coughs> They're not perfect. They desire perfection and do everything in their power to obtain it, but they're human. And sometimes even their best efforts end up in the red. These are experts at the cutting edge of that performance in that area. An expert considers why the deviation occurred, takes corrective action, and proceeds forward. Defective performance is part of obtaining excellence. I'm going to say that again. Defective performance is part of obtaining excellence. It is a necessary part of it. Let's look a little bit further, though, in the scripture in 2 Peter, going back there and the process that's mediated <clears throat> by the Spirit through our knowledge of Him. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and erite whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Oh now, this sounds quite good. Exceeding great and precious, precious promises? Whatever's following has got to be good when you describe it that way. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Seriously? Are you partaking of the divine nature? Is there anyone here who really feels like I have partaken of the divine nature? I hope so. If you're reflecting him to the world, you have to have. Partake of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What did we see was a common link of all those pastors going down? A 
falling to lust. They fell to the corruption that's in the world. And so do their sheep. Keep going, verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence. Here we go. Diligence, steady, earnest, energetic effort. This is directly what the word says. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, erite. Add to your faith, erite. And to erite, knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control or temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. Or your, your verse may say charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Why are the sheep scattered and wandering astray? The shepherds are blind. They've been blinded by the corruption of the world. If the shepherds are blind, the sheep are going with them. That's part of the problem. Okay? Having been purged from the sins of this world. Wherefore, verse 10, um, wherefore, the the rather, brethren, give diligence, there's the effort again, to make your calling and election sure, for if we do these things, you shall never fall. Huh. How do we prevent falls like we've had up there? Well, if you give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance knowing that shortly I must put off my off this tab this my tabernacle even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me okay what are the great and precious promises they are spiritually bestowed a sequence of gifts what must we seek to escape from lust what do we have lust for? We have lust for sex. We have lust for distraction. We have lust for inactivity. We have lust for pleasure. We have lust for gluttony. These are just some of the lusts, but those lusts are big in our society. How do you know? Goodness gracious, people are glued to their, their, their phones. They're all glued to their phone. I need distraction. I can't think about the Lord, I need distraction. We have lusts that are from the world, but we can be freed from them. Please then note the order here. Not the order. Does a Christian just automatically flow down this path? Does it just happen? Well, if it did, then why would he have to keep saying with all diligence and with all diligence and with all diligence? He keeps saying that on purpose. There's a reason. You don't just flow down the path. It's only with diligence that you go down that path. Excellence is a choice. Excellence is a habit. Look at, the, look at how it goes there. You have faith. Nothing, nothing occurs if you don't have faith. Why? Because all of these come through the workings of the Spirit within you. And if you don't have faith, the Spirit is in you. Nothing can happen. But if you have faith, then the Spirit can inspire you to the efforts, manly, heavy lifting efforts necessary to go further. 
There are a lot of people who want to skip to number three. It's all about the Bible. It's all about the Bible. Yes, it's part of it, but it's not the next thing. The next thing is arete. That's what the word says. And so why do we not know the Bible? Because we skipped a step. Because if you're not willing to discipline yourself to reading the Bible with effort and completeness and squeezing it, then you're not going to get the knowledge. You know, Barnum said that when you ask evangelicals, how many of you read your Bible in between Sundays? Evangelicals, how many of you think? Read your, read your Bible once in between Sundays. The number, evangelicals, 33%. One in three. Why do they not know anything? Why are they wandering off with these bad shepherds? Because they skipped step two. Because if you've actually engaged with step two and made that choice for excellence and dedicated yourself to discipline yourself in your entire life, then you will dig into the Word. And what happens when you dig into the Word? It's very interesting. You end up with self-control. And what happens when you end self-control? You don't do what those pastors did because you have self-control. And you're, you won't engage in the lusts that are of the world. That's how the process works. And when you have self-control, you become patient. You don't get upset. You don't get frazzled. Life doesn't shake you up. Life isn't like... You have patience. And then how will you appear to the world? Godly. Because a person who doesn't get shaken up and who's patient and self-controlled and disciplined and doing their work with Arete, they look godly. And what will naturally happen to you? You won't have to work at it. You'll be kind to others because the Lord will sponsor, will bring it out of you. It will be natural to you. It will be a natural flow from what is inside you. Do you have difficulty showing kindness to others, doing acts of kindness? Oh, got to help the lady next door. Oh, okay. All right, I got to ramp myself up to it. Okay, I got to. Or does it just seem like it's it, because excellence is a choice and excellence is a habit? I saw the need. I met the need. So that's why brotherly kindness comes naturally to that person, and that is a loving person. You see, the problem is in this world, they want to, uh, they want to jump it. They want to go from faith. I'm saved. We need to be loving. We need to love the world and love them in their sin and love, love, love. God is love. But what have they done? They skipped all the steps. They went from faith all the way down to love. But what do they not have? They don't even know the Lord that they supposedly have faith in. Because had they engaged with him up in step two and three, they would know that what they are doing is actually not loving. Because ushering someone to hell is an unkind act. That's not brotherly love. That's not human love. It's not love at all. It's horrible behavior. It's evil. So we have to have diligence if we're going to go down these steps. It takes effort. Why is that? Because excellence is a choice. Excellence is a habit. Paul termed it, termed it this way. Know you that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. And every man that strives for the mastery and is temperate in all things now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so I fight, not as one that beats the air, but I keep under my body and bring it unto, into subjection, lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. 
This is what those shepherds were fighting with. They didn't bring their body under subjection. The sheep haven't done it either. Hebrews 12.1 Wherefore, seeing we also are encompassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against him, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Finally, 2 Timothy 4.2. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Let me finish up with this. You can see this. It may seem a little odd. Go with me here on this. What you see here is a sword and a picture of a guy. This is a sword that was presented to both of my sons when they came of age. They both have one of these swords. It's called William the Marshall Sword. <laughs> William Marshall was the first Earl of Pembroke. He was eulogized by the Archbishop of Canterbury in the year 1219 as the best knight that ever lived. He served five kings, fought in innumerable wars, crusades, and tournaments, never losing, including his last war, which he led for the king at the age of 70. He was out front in the charge, a 70-year-old. Think about that. His life started in a far from smooth fashion. At the age of six years old, his dad switched loyalty from the king to a rival. The king besieged their castle, taking William hostage and threatened to hang him if, he didn't, if his dad didn't surrender and pledge loyalty to the king. His dad sent the following message, I still have the hammer and the anvil with which to forge still more and better sons. Thanks a lot, Dad. I appreciate the love. So they loaded William into a trebuchet, which is a catapult, with the intention to launch him into the castle. His father's response? Crickets. They saw him them doing it. The king had mercy on William, and he released him a year later when the conflict had resolved. William had learned an important lesson. He knew that his father cared nothing for him, so he set about to be the best and most accomplished knight. What had he learned? Take care of those around you, the weak, the infirmed, the conquered. He was known for his chivalry, including not killing Richard the Lionheart, prior to him becoming the king, and uh, when he had bested him in battle, he instead killed his horse. He said, I'm going to kill your horse. I'll leave you alive. Why did he do that? He had learned something in his early life's experience. Richard the Lionheart would become king later, and not surprisingly, he wanted William Marshall to be his lead knight. Oh, I wonder why. Human life is not to be wasted when it can be avoided. It was his character that led him uh, be, to be asked to be one of the signers of the Magna Carta. I gave my sons this sword as a reminder. Valor is an expectation of their creator. Valor is an expectation of their creator. The strength and discipline of mind and body is required if you're to be sanctified into a knowledgeable, controlled, patient, godly, kind, and finally loving individual. There is no other path to love. All others are corrupt and worldly, and they're inventions of Satan. 
Excellence can be your choice. Excellence can be your habit. But only if you choose it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. Lord God, we see in your word what we're called to. Glory and valorous excellence. That's what you call us to. We cannot get there. And we know that. Because we've tried. We've tried disciplining ourselves. We fail repeatedly. Lord God, we pray that when we call out to you and we dedicate ourselves to that level of excellence, that you will move us. You know how stiff-necked we are that you will change us. Because if you do change us, Lord God, we know what will happen. The peace within our lives will abound. We'll be patient in times of duress. We'll, be, we'll show brotherly kindness to those around us. Love will be our native form of behavior. The world will see a godly, unique nature to us and wonder why. And your name will be glorified. Lord God, we desire that. We pray that you'd move that in each of our lives. In your blessed name we pray. Amen.